I see some folks trickling from the previous session. I see some folks joining in for this session. Daniel brings in obviously in the good mood and the dancing. I want to say I think you're in the sun, but you're not. You're you're in London this week, right? So I've heard it's nice. Uh, no sun for you, I guess. <laughs> uh, hey, Jan. Hi, Lydia and Kevin. Anna's here. Uh, while we're waiting for everyone to join, uh, humor me, humor us, and do share an onboarding horror story that happened to you. You hopefully not something you've made possible for someone else because we know better than that. But we're talking about onboarding today, so let's kick it off with some uh, horror stories. You see a poll open to the left side of the screen where you can type your answer in and click submit so it reaches us on the other end. AJ's here as well. Dea, hey Dea. We're looking for horror stories, everyone. Onboarding horror stories. Where's my computer? <laughs> LOL. <laughs> We're on record now. <laughs> I hope this doesn't reach the <laughs> my manager. Previous manager is not chess. That chess is not you. Um, I uh, I arrived on my uh, first day at work, and uh, my manager was in front of the building with other colleagues, and they were having a smoke in the morning. <laughs> I was like, "Hi, I am here reporting to duty," and they were like, "Oh, I thought you're starting on Monday." It was a Wednesday. <laughs> And it's like, woohoo, we're, we're off on a good start. Uh, it was brilliant in the end. They, everyone was really helpful and uh, they pivoted on the spot. Uh, but yeah, uh, that, was a, that was a mini horror story there. AJ, design an onboarding process and people refuse to turn on camera and going on mural for the icebreakers. Harsh. Okay. You joined two days later. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Before. <laughs> All right. Uh, keep the horror stories coming. Remember that you have to click submit so they uh, so they reach uh, so they reach us. And welcome. My name is Anne Ring. I'm leading the Butter Community Project. I am very excited uh, for this work summit that we're hosting this afternoon or morning, depends on where you are in the world. And very, very happy to be with uh, Daniel for the next hour. Uh, there we go. He's uh, waving at us. Hi, Daniel, um, aka the agency man, right? That's That's a cool brand right there. And Daniel, he's helping agencies build non-ego advisory boards for uh, with his company, Polymenta. Over the years, he's getting that good look behind the curtain on how they're run, what makes them successful, where they fail, what can be improved, etc. And as part of that journey, uh, he built the Agents Collective, a peer community for agency founders, um, and has helped over 100 agencies successfully grow their business. He lives in Portugal, he's in London today, he loves surfing and the outdoors. So Daniel, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for accepting my invite and tell us. How do we onboard employees so they never, ever, ever leave unless we want them to? I was about to say that's the most important part of it, isn't it? Um, thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. Uh, we've got we've got um, actually enough sort of uh, people here to make this quite a lovely, intimate, almost workshoppy style thing. I mean, I'm going to present something and, and give you some really practical tips, but feel free to to inject anything that you you want to into the discussion, right? Because as much as it is about me teaching you things. Um, you know, you have a lot of the learnings that you will have um, had over the years as well. But I'm quite curious, actually, like how many of you here? Uh, well, I'm assuming you all work in an agency, right? Uh, just quick sort of hands up from the ones that I have the video on. Uh, maybe working in an agency. Yeah, thumbs up. There's one thumbs up. Um, couple of thumbs up. I like it. 
Uh, is any one of you in a HR or a people operations role at an agency? Just give us a thumbs up there as well, if you are. No? Okay. Founders, agency founders, quick thumbs up. Yeah, 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 a few ones. Brilliant. Okay, cool. That gives me a bit of an idea of where you all sit in the uh, in, in, in this particular topic. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here real quick quick um bear of me i will disappear i will disappear well i will still be here but you will all disappear um but i'll come back in a second uh right we're sharing your screen now um so as i mentioned uh, this topic today is going to be all about how to onboard new employees um so they never leave unless you obviously want them to it's a really important point there um the other point that's really important here is that this report that we put together at polymenza which is the company i run was actually uh, done during um, COVID when everyone sort of had to quickly move into remote. So actually a lot of the stuff is related to if you're onboarding employees in a virtual setting. However, it is fully, fully transferable also to onboarding employees um, that are coming into the office. So I think that's a really, really important caveat. Now, um, a bit more about me uh, at the top left of um, uh, the the image of the group there is those are the kind of events that I run with agencies and um, basically I help agencies build uh, non advisory boards. Uh, that's the best best way to put it, and I call it your non ego advisory board. Uh, and we have a community as part of that as well. So we have a really tight knit group of agencies where we learn from each other as well. And the agency sizes that I typically work with are between twenty and fifty employees. And the main reason for that is is that they're um, it's sort of the first stage of where they've got their leadership team. Um, for the first time, they have to structure that. A lot of the founders that get to that point also sort of reach a little bit the pinnacle of their own knowledge and they don't know what, what's up next, right? So um, so that's a, that's a little bit insight to, to business life, um, personal life. Uh, some of this has already been revealed. Um, I moved with my girlfriend to Portugal last year. I, I lived uh, in the UK for the last 19 years. Um, one of my hobbies I've picked up since I've been there has been surfing and I've gone with the whole gear of the long hair and everything. Um, and that lovely picture on the right hand side, which will never, ever go out of your head again, <laughs> is, uh, is actually something I posted on LinkedIn. And the reason I posted that on LinkedIn was because I was raising money for my charity on a charity walk. And, uh, and believe it or not, it ended up raising about 15,000 pounds thanks to that image. And, uh, I did try to auction off the pot as well, but um, didn't get anything for that. So there you go, <laughs> a little bit of a story. Right, before we get started though, I've got a question for you. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing now because I can see all your lovely faces and avatars again. Uh, stop sharing there. What is the biggest challenge you have right now when onboarding your employees? I'm curious. And you can do this in two ways. Right, Anne Marie. Uh, they can either write this in the actual um, uh, question poll that we put up yep. there, or uh, if you'd like to, you can come off mute as well and um, speak it out. Sure thing. Uh, yeah, ensuring consistency across all employees onboarded. And I'm assuming that's. Um, also dependent on whether they're maybe starting off their career, uh, whether they're coming in as a as a really senior role. Um, and when I say senior, I don't usually like that term, I must admit, and same thing with junior. Um, but what I mean by that is uh, when they're coming in maybe as a, as a role where they have to head up a, a department or something like that, that there's maybe differences there as well, which is quite interesting in its own right, because there's the expectation that you know they come in and everything, you know, they can roll with everything straight away. Giving the right information and device support also provide inclusive environments. Yeah, and that's particularly hard when it comes to the whole hybrid setup. I think that's been a real tricky bit for, for agencies in the last um, few few months, well, years really now. Uh, giving them time to ramp up and learn at a manageable pace versus filling capacity gaps we hired them for. Yeah, how quickly do you get them started, right? Two days early? <laughs> Uh, I don't know about them. My agency where two people can't fund this, but I support you on so onboarding their challenges. Yep. And do you know what? Uh, some of this stuff will be applicable to that as well um, because the customer experience and the employee experience is also very similar um, often. But I can kind of get an idea now of what you're all looking for. And 
one other thing I wanted to mention is I'm going to present to you a couple of things from this report that we did, but I only want to spend about 20 minutes doing that. I'd actually like to encourage you to come off mute after that and have a bit of a dialogue about this because there's certain things that you will have um, that you can share that is valuable for everyone else here, right? So I want to make this a little bit more of a group discussion afterwards. Uh, just looking at the other one, when onboarding project managers, uh, no employee org, find challenge of managing their access to common workspaces and familiarity with the tools we use for collaboration. Yeah, very, very, very uh, tricky thing, especially when you're early stage in, a, in an agency as well, um, having a central space for everything, doing well, matching people, energy and passion to project work, operation is small, it's, yeah, small struggle. Again, yeah, it depends on the size of the agency you're at. That's going to be more difficult. If you're bigger, you can usually structure things in a way where you can put the right people on the right projects or like the going by the passions. When it's a bit smaller, it's a bit difficult, right? Um, and employees to learn about our big uh, ecosystem, be quick onboarding and hybrid setting. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. Really, really good. Um, I'm going to pop back my little presentation here I've got for you. So again, a bit of a background here. In 2020, um, our sector was forced to shift to a remote working model pretty quickly, as you all know, and I've experienced um, for most agencies, that was also uh, the first time stepping into a remote environment and hiring in a virtual environment was a first and that was really, really hard for people. So we decided at that point, because all of the agencies that we were working with were like, wow, how do we do this? So we decided, let's put this all together um, as a research piece, let's ask some companies who have either already been remote before uh, the, the uh, pandemic hit off um, and, and also companies that had to transition and what were the ones that were doing really well. And we ended up asking, um, skip that part, we're going to end up asking 41 companies, right? So this is a research base of this. And uh, it was qualitative interviews. So we went quite into quite a lot of depth, um, trying to understand really what were they doing well and what didn't work so well. The size of the companies were between 40 and 350 employees. Um, so we had a nice wide range. Most of them were agencies, but some of them were also SaaS businesses, right? So just to um, say that, and, and, and I actually think that's always a quite important thing when, uh, when you look at uh, uh, research pieces like this, that we don't have this echo chamber of just looking at other agencies, right? Because there's all, there's all other companies out there that are doing this well. Most of them were UK-based. Um, some of them were in the US as well. And that just gives you an idea of the breadth of this whole research. What I'm going to do over the next few slides is just share with you the highlights. There's a full report, um, which uh, Anna Maria is going to uh, share later on. And, um, and you can download the whole report. I think it's about 56 pages. It's brilliant. There's loads of really practical stuff in there. Uh, but I'm going to just share with you some of the highlights and, uh, and some of these things you may already do, which is fantastic. Give yourself a round of applause for that. Or there'll be new things for you that you think, ah, yeah, great. Actually, this is something we really, really need to be doing. So let's start off with the key onboarding phases. And, and it's quite interesting to uh, hear that one of the first horror stories where it was around uh, someone forgetting um, you know, or not getting their computer, right? Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But interesting, when we looked at these 41 companies, they all had, well, not all, but most of them had very similar stages in terms of the onboarding. And that usually started off with something that was called pre-boarding, which is the, the bit that happens before, uh, once they've signed, but before they start their first day, right? Once they've signed the, the, the contract, um, before they start the first day. Now, depending on the, the, the circumstances, that may be a really short period for you, um, especially if you have like a massive need uh, and, and you want someone to start immediately. Uh, but in, in a lot of cases, there's a little bit of a space between that because they have a notice period that they have to work off and things like that. And during that time, um, there's a lot of things that you can do to make sure that the, your new employees are going to be super, super happy as soon as they start. So that pre-boarding phase is quite a key one. Um, and it definitely came out with the ones that were doing really, really well. The next thing is the first day, obviously, um, that that uh, uh, day that was two days early for Anna Maria. <laughs> so, uh, so that's your first day. The next one is the first and the second week. And then after that, the next 30, 60, and 90 days, right? Now, again, really, really important. Bear in mind the size of the companies and that the majority probably sat more around the kind of 50 to 100 employees. Um, if, if you're at an agency that's really, really big, 
Now, there might be a much, much longer period here because, again, you have a lot more resources to also do um, learning, uh, learning and development with people that don't necessarily straight away have to step into their job, right? So this is something to just bear in mind, right, depending on the sizes of your agency. But these were the phases that most of them, most of them had. I'm going to tell you a few highlights of each one of those phases that came up. So for pre-boarding, look, the, the key thing was communication. So if you don't have uh, someone that's dedicated to, say, um, people operations or HR at the moment who can take on this role, then definitely whoever um, should be on this, like from the get-go, because it's really clear, right? Like if if someone um, is, is about to start with you and they're sending you an email and you're responding two days later, then that doesn't really show them that you care that much, right? So the, the communication response time um, was, was very much immediate, especially in that pre-boarding stage. Uh, the other thing was a clear outline of the onboarding process. So um, a lot of the companies that we researched actually had a one to two week onboarding schedule ready um, so this, this schedule included uh, sort of when they uh, start, when they should start, but also calendar invites to all of the key meetings that are going to happen. And I think that's quite an interesting thing as well, um, just already having that all set up so that, that if they then, as soon as they have access basically to their email accounts and everything, um, they can immediately see what's going to happen over the, over the next two weeks. Right? So that was a, a key thing that happened pre-boarding before they started. Uh, and then obviously the welcome pack and equipment. So 87% of the companies uh, ensured that new starters receive a welcome box with swag and their equipment before their first day of work, if possible. Now, um, during the pandemic, that was quite tricky for a lot of companies, but now definitely that is possible. And if they're in, you know, coming in person, then they can probably pick that up anyways. But yeah, having that all set up, uh, especially um, if you have quite complex IT, that's also really, really important that that's all ready to go. So on the first day, they can literally open up their laptop and it's all, it's all good. Um, there's no complications there. So those are some of the uh, first highlights. I reckon the next one, yeah. Someone mentioned something, I can't remember what exactly um, it was. I think something around project managers and that being quite difficult to onboard project managers. So a lot of the companies that we uh, we basically searched, said that they had provided org charts with profile images um, so that people knew exactly where they would sit in that org chart, if possible, right? Now, um, sometimes if you're very doing a specific skill set, you're not necessarily know yet which team you're going to be in. But generally speaking, you'll have an idea roughly who's going to be your line manager, you know, who's going to be um, uh, important to you, um, and just making sure who your contact points are as well, right? Uh, so that that's something that really, really helped people. And especially if you're onboarding them virtually as well, um, that they have some images, a name and everything so that when they go on to say a Teams call or a Zoom with all these people that they know who they are, right? That there's a there's an immediate relationship there. Not all of them did this, but the ones that were really keen on getting people started with um, with a learning plan, uh, uh, with the learning development is basically put together a personalized learning and development plan, um, which included a lot of self-directed learning. And I think that's a really, really important bit because oftentimes what happens, especially in smaller agencies, um, is that beginning bit when everyone is so busy to properly onboard um, the, the new person, there's, a, there's often big gaps, right? And those gaps can either be used to maybe look at some of the information that they've, they've received in their first week and so on, but also those gaps can be used to already start doing some learning development stuff um, when they're actually not being put onto projects yet. So this was something that was really, really valuable. And it also made people feel like they're, they're actually already progressing in their job as opposed to just sitting around and waiting for people. So, um, so that's some of the stuff around pre-boarding. First day. This is an this was well, this was a particularly interesting one uh, when this all kicked off because uh, when everyone suddenly moved to Teams, to Slack, to whatever channels you were using for communication, uh, there was this this need for people to be online constantly. 
And I don't know what your rules are internally in terms of uh, notifications around this, but having a clear guidance on it and a clear policy was something that we saw a lot of the companies um, uh, do that, that were doing really well do. And I think that sort of takes off the pressure a little bit of the person that might be onboarded in a virtual setting um, because they're not maybe not having the pressure that they constantly need to be on or be seen as being on, right? So having something uh, or having really clear um, guidance around this was was something that came up uh, over and over again as well. A profile of the new starter. So this was not only for recruitment marketing purposes, but obviously also for um, everyone on the team to know, you know, who's um, who's the new starter. Uh, what are their hobbies? Maybe some like personal things so that they get to know them. Um, again. This is relevant whether you're onboarding someone uh, virtually or whether you're onboarding them in a, a normal setting, right? Because there's going to be people that are maybe not in the office when this person is being onboarded. Um, but that's the first day that they're starting. It would be great for them to know, hey, who's the person that's going to be there sat next to me when I'm back in the office tomorrow, right? Um, so, and obviously also for recruitment marketing purposes, this was great. So we saw a lot of people putting it on their blog and so on um, to, to show off the, the, the great new starters that they had. A few highlights from first and second week were, and I think someone mentioned this in the um, in the what's your biggest challenge, was this sort of have this fine balance of too much information, not enough information. Uh, I think one of the things that was really crucial was that they were, um, although a lot of them invited them to a lot of the meetings, they were also making it really clear to the new starters which meetings are absolutely essential and which ones are optional and the same thing with the reading material that they were giving them uh, so that they're not massively overloading them right and uh, and that's really key because there's a tendency or probably a laziness a little bit just to go right here's everything off you go and come back when you've learned everything right and um and we know that's really hard to do that so really kind of uh bringing it down into bite-sized pieces that they can learn things like that that balancing bit was uh, was really key and especially uh, in the in, in the stages when it really, if you're fully remote, this is even more and more important, right? Because there's a lot of overload on having way too many meetings as well, especially in that first uh, and second week. Something that was really, really, really quite powerful um, and had fantastic feedback from all employees um, when we spoke to these various different companies was meeting the founders and the directors of the company. Now, if your agency is um, really big, this is possibly quite hard to do and uh, a way to go around this is is doing some sort of uh, hey meet the ceo kind of thing where there's a q and a you can have a chat with it you get that often in big um, saas companies as well they do that but obviously if your if your agency is at a at a, as a size where the founder can take this time it makes a massive massive impact because it really shows the employee that 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 the founders care and obviously the whole company cares about them so if you can make this happen 100% include that in your onboarding process. Another thing that came up um, in the first and second week was uh, this buddy system. And the buddy system had, there, there were lots of different variations here. Uh, so one, it may have been someone that's uh, they're, they're sort of in their same department, but actually what we saw it happen more of was Say, for example, if they're new starters to um, uh, to their career, maybe there's someone that's been around in the career that they match them up with, or they're, they're uh, matching them up with other new starters as well, because then they feel a little bit more like they've got other people that are maybe similar age to them or um, of similar skill set <laughs> level to, uh, to interact with. Um, or it could be someone from a totally different department. The whole point around this was um, that they would have someone beyond their line manager um, or their HR manager that they could reach out to if, for example, their line manager is busy. Because that's always the hardest bit, right? Like when you're starting a new job and you've got loads and loads of questions, but you don't want to constantly ask your line manager, um, you don't want to annoy them. It doesn't matter how much they tell you, hey, it's okay to ask me loads of questions. Everyone feels bad at some point when they're asked the hundredth question in the same day, right? Um, so, so having another buddy to maybe answer some of these questions sort of alleviates that uh, pressure of of um, having one source of information. I think this bit is something that uh, we just kept in here for when it was back uh, when actually COVID happened. I think this is something that now is 
is is done in in various different ways um and some people like that and some people didn't but that was something that worked back then um so let's ignore that for now i'm sure you've got your own ways of how you integrate the social bit into it the 30 60 90 days one this one was really interesting so not all companies but some of them that we highlighted as doing particularly well um, especially with their onboarding or the retention of employees, had these surveys where they did 30, 60, 90 day surveys to check whether new starters um, feel that the company is meeting their expectations, right? And I think this is a really, really important bit. It's kind of a, a, a different angle, right? It's, it's not like, hey, is the new starter uh, meeting our expectations? Uh, it's the other way around. And this often was a question that was asked and then discussed initially with the people ops or HR manager, and then the HR people ops manager would then speak to the line managers, right? So, so this would not necessarily be something that would go directly to the line managers, but you can set it up like that as well if you don't have uh, an HR person. Um, so it was interesting. In one of the companies, uh, they said basically they send a survey after 90 days that asks, do you feel the company's meeting your expectations? If the answer is no, most new starters handed in their notice before nine months. Uh, if undecided, they stay a maximum of 14 months. And this was a company that was about 150 employees and they were recruiting on a regular basis. So they had quite a lot of data on this. And I thought that was really interesting um, to see. So, so really checking that pulse in those 30, 60, 90 days is, is, is super key in the onboarding process. Right, so that's it. Let's discuss, um, because like I said, I, did, I told you I didn't want you to just uh, have, a, have an hour long presentation. I'd love to discuss this topic with you um, and see if you have any, first of all, any questions really. And, and feel free to come up mute because we're, we're, we're only 12 people, which is nice and intimate. Um, I'll jump in if that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Go for it, Kate. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, what I love that. Team? I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, it's just, it's not really a question. It's just something that I've, I've picked up um, when I go in for consulting in different agencies and whatnot. Um, that I still find that I have to stress to founders why it is so critical to have. Uh, it sounds so dull. Uh, but an engaging and onboarding experience because it really is the ultimate retention strategy. And um, I, I, I mean, I actually just spoke to a founder that I did a contract with the other day and they're still complaining about the, their retention, but yet they're not investing in the onboarding. And I, I think it's I, it just it fascinates me why it's still like people are not getting it, how critical onboarding is. And it's just kind of, I don't know how else to, to get it through their heads. <laughs> yeah. So, it's you know. a, I think, thank you for sharing that, Kate. I mean, it's a, it's a tricky one, right? Like, especially for agencies and, and again, it depends on the size of the agency, right? Like this is, I, I don't know for the, for the agencies that are here, like um, what sizes you are, um, but depending on the size of the agency, obviously this is easier to implement um, and if you're a relatively small agency, when I say small, anything from sort of, you know, five, 10 employees up to, to say 30 employees, um, it's a bit trickier because oftentimes, first of all, you won't have a person who's fully dedicated to making sure that this is, is, is there, right? Which tends to land on a, a people operations or HR uh, person's plate. Um, and if that person isn't there, then what happens is you know, you're, you're, you're working at such a fast pace with your clients, right? Like, and, and the, 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 the clients come in, they want something straight away done. And then you're like, oh, but we don't have enough people. So you're hiring quickly to just put the people onto it. And there's just no, no real time, you know, which is slightly different to like a product based business where you know what your roadmap is and you kind of start hiring ahead of the curve a bit and then you bring them in. Right. So, so you're absolutely right, Kate. Look, I'd, I'd love it as well if all agencies could um, could get this right, but it it is a it is a tricky one. And and um, the, the the thing I would recommend is having one dedicated 
to uh, to making sure that onboarding is is right. So giving someone the responsibility, it may not be a people ops um, or, or manager in in the company, but just giving someone that responsibility of taking care of that onboarding process, I think, is a really good way of doing it. That's great. Thank you. And can I add something to this point as well? Because I think those 30, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days checkpoints or surveys, if they're done right and analyzed properly, you could go back to the decision makers to actually showcase the negative impact of a poorly done onboarding. Because uh, maybe the reason they don't listen is because they really don't have the data or they don't understand that it has a negative impact on their attention because there's no data out there and there's no sense making of what's happening. So I think that measurement is very important to build the business case. If you want, then go back to them and be like, this matters to people. It might not matter to you, but it matters to everyone else. So how do we fix this? Yeah. And I think, I think one of the, um, you know, I think uh, so. It's a uh, is it AJ? Do, do, do I pronounce yeah. it right? AJ or AJ? I'm I'm not sure. Like, what's the proper pronunciation? Whatever you like to call me doesn't matter. Uh, my white friends call me AJ, but it is Ajay. Ajay, uh, okay. You breathe in when you call my name, not breathe out. Okay, uh, that's the only thing. Uh, I I just had a comment to make, and uh, this is around. Uh, my uh, observation and experience with surveys. Uh, in a nutshell, we found it to be uh, not giving us the kind of insights uh, that we desired. Maybe it was a design of the survey that we could have changed. But generally speaking, whenever people see a survey form, they go mechanically just uh, click on, you know, uh, if it is a scale of one to five, you'll just have five, four, five, four, five, four. Uh, because people just want to get through with that task. And I agree with Anna Maria that if you are not uh, making sense out of the uh, data we get and report back the insights that we have got and the actions we are taking, uh, it really, really doesn't serve any purpose. It's just a thing that people are getting done. And when in one context, uh, we uh, were able to check uh, uh, and have a deeper conversation with the founders and people concerned about organization and people in general. We've we've asked that what is the purpose of doing this, uh, and the answer that popped up is that we want people to be happy. We want to make sure that you know their well-being, uh, you know they 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 feel good and well working with us. And we moved to an experiment where we dropped the surveys. And we started doing a mental well-being check-in polls every week and simple questions. Uh, Daniel, did you look after yourself this week? Did you feel you were uh, you know, looked after? Uh, did you treat yourself well? Are you frustrated? Are you annoyed? Something on those lines. Uh, and the kind of insights that we started getting were far more enriching, inspiring, and of course, we pushed it to the reporting managers. And, you know, we started building on that. And now, of course, uh, that experiment is scaled up. We're working with a neuroscientist. And the challenge is employee well-being and not employee satisfaction survey. Employee satisfaction comes with the salary that you pay. And if you're paying well, people are happy with you. <laughs> and they want to continue getting their money. So they will give you all great scores, 10 on 10, 5 on 5. Uh, so we wanted to get past that. And we generally wanted to do something. I mean, that founder wanted to generally do something different. Uh, so I think uh, the surveys, they suck. Uh, if you're not making sense out of it. and uh, it's 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 a misleading thin data doesn't it's not working anymore. Love it. I think that's a that's a really really great idea. Um, I think there's also a, an important bit that you mentioned there, which is you're doing it weekly, which I think is a is a really important point here because it it you know it's the same like feedback, right? Like if you give if you give an employee feedback once every quarter on their you know quarterly review. 
um, and you've bottled up everything up until that point, I mean, you've probably already lost the person. Whereas if you, you know, on a, on, on a regular basis have an open feedback culture, um, then, you know, you, you almost don't have to have a quarterly review in that sense, right, to, to do that. So I, I like that idea of doing it on a regular basis where you say, you know, yeah, every week yeah. we're doing that pulse. Um, are you use, are you using uh, actual pulse surveys or have you just created your own? Your own oh, uh, well, we, we, it's an experiment that we just tested. Yeah. So uh, uh, we just, you know, brainstorm and put, you know, like a few five questions together uh, and we tested it out. We got a very positive response. We rebranded our buddies. We called them well-being buddies. So you were not yeah. discussing work, but you were, you know, discussing about your well-being, whether it's financial, mental, whatever relationship. I don't know what whatever they felt comfortable discussing. And that inspired us further. So now we're working with a neuroscientist uh, and learning more how to uh, make it more uh, diagnostic and monthly well-being camps are being planned where we will do more clinical diagnosis with some crazy inventions that we have come because I happen to work more with uh, startup uh, innovators and inventors. So I get to you know experience some cutting edge stuff. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of things happening in that space, right? Mental wellness is a big thing. And how do we integrate that in employee well-being programs is what we are experimenting with. Uh, so I, I'm sorry I'm taking a lot of time, but uh, hey, no, I think I think that was a really really great input. Um, thanks yeah. a lot for that, and that's that's why I said you know I, I want to make sure that we're we're not just, like my whole thing, and one of the reasons I run what I run, um, uh, it's called Polymenza for a reason, uh, as in multiple smart brains, right? Because I am, I believe um, if you want to solve a problem, you need to speak to as many people as possible so that you get all the different perspectives and you can reduce the blind spots that you have, right? Because oftentimes there is no like real clear cut answer for anyone, right? Because every business is slightly different, you know, everyone has a slight different culture and so on. So um, so this is this is super, like, thanks a lot for that. I think that's a really, really valuable point. I think business is the same world over with only one goal to make money now, as well as in the future, no morals attached. It's the contextual cultures, which, which, which makes it how people work in that context. Uh, 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 so business is the same world over. It's all about making money now as well as in the future. That's it, period. There you go. If someone, if someone tells me we are saving the world and we are doing this bullshit, you need money to make that thing happen. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go and get down to business. Uh, sorry, I'm having fun with you guys. Uh, Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or any other input? Oh, look at that GIF. And Marie, you're you're showing off properly, aren't you? Do you know what? I, I, this the, this is the first time I'm using this, um, and I've decided I'm I, I'm literally I'm 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 doing this all voluntarily uh, and so on, right? Like, I mean, I am going to be using this app afterwards. I think it's so bloody cool. You can say that <laughs> twice. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Any um any other questions or inputs, ideas as well around this topic of onboarding? I have some, Go I have a it. thought that uh, crystallized as I was uh, listening to Ajay, Ajay talk. Um, oh, Jay. Ajay. Ajay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it was it was very interesting. I used to I worked in HR and in LD. So onboarding is was very it uh, was very close to my heart and one of the big tasks that we had to implement and like experiment with and you you see all sorts of things, good and bad. And there's a there's a relatively big difference in between onboarding folks in offline um, setting and onboarding them in virtual hybrid settings. And I think if I were to think of what is the main element that I perceived to be different is the fact that people can feel very easily not seen. We are yeah. in the office and you're going to work every day. You feel seen because you are seen because it doesn't matter if you're talking to each other, if we have a meeting or we have to work on a project or we don't have, you're passing my desk and I look at you and you look at me and then I am seen, I am there, I'm visible. And I think that for virtual 
hybrid, fully remote is very hard not to feel seen because you are not seen. If you're not in a Zoom link, in a, in a Zoom or butter link or whatever link and seeing session with your colleagues, you're not seen. You're alone at your desk in your home. And so how do we make people feel seen? And I've learned that you don't have to like very small things make a massive difference in this case. And just to give you a couple, so Butter is fully remote. Uh, it's a fully remote company. And there were a couple of things in the way I was onboarded, for example, and Chess is here to confirm uh, that were very surprising for me. And I have not experienced them when I was onboarding offline prior to Butter. And one of the, just a couple of examples, um, after your, you know, you have your, interviews with folks and then you get the offer from the same people and you don't know anyone else in the company the moment i signed the offer i started receiving emails from chris and adam from important people the founders of the company that had never seen during the interview we never exchanged email they had no idea who i was the moment i said i signed the contract i started receiving these emails like oh my god we have to have you so cool that you signed and i was like wow this is really nice um and that's an easy thing but i felt very seen right i felt like i've they never saw me but i felt seen and another thing was i got the invitation to attend a social before i joined the company for example i had a, a I, I had a one month um a notice period of course and i just received the invitation hey we run our socials every two weeks and this friday is our next one can you be with us so I joined the team and I was already part of the team, although it was it was not even my first day, right? So those very small things felt very impactful to me. Um, maybe that's a challenge that I, I'll, I'll put us for us in the room. How do we how do we help people feel seen, although we don't see them by default as they walk in to the work to work every day? Yeah, I love that. I think it's such a such a great point, and I'm looking forward to what everyone has to say on that. Um, one of the one of the things that all of this, uh, whatever, whatever you want to call it, remote, hybrid, um, working, flexible working, working from home, has given us is the need to be more prepared, the need to be intentional about stuff, the need to plan properly. And I think, I think. Um, of course, stuff needed to be done before as well, but it was a lot easier, you know. You you can you can get away with stuff, you know, when when you have an office and everyone's there and you can be a bit lazy with a new employee comes in and just sits down and is like, you know, hey, there's people. Oh, by the way, the coffee machine's over there and you can go and do that, you know. And I think I think it's uh it, the I would say the companies that probably um, are struggling the most with doing what you've just described are the ones that are just not intentional about it, right? Like really intentional about it and really thinking about this in, in, in as a as a as a topic. Uh, so so you know it's easy to 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 get lazy uh, on that, and and when you get lazy on that, of course you know you end up having a um, an onboarding process that is not is not ideal, and you'll have people leaving. You know, um, but I'm really curious to hear what others others have to say and if there's any tips around this as well that you've experienced at your companies. Am I next? Maybe. I think a, a, a joy was in the, <laughs> in the queue and then you're there. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, a couple of things I just want to add and I'm here to what you just shared about visibility and I was just comparing it to uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, and during COVID and post-COVID world that we are in and, you know, some quick things uh, in, in the physical world pre-COVID before we went remote or online and now we are hybrid. Uh, visibility uh, in larger organization, I, and I'm I'm not talking about the experiences in startup context because Butter I feel is a very startup context. When we are small, we are far more intimate. When we start growing and becoming bigger, uh, somewhere that intimacy is you know uh, it's it's lost. Uh, uh, 
uh, and there's a lot of distance that gets created. So anything over 50 people in an organization, uh, we see a lot of you know dilution of a lot of intent uh, and complexity increases. And we have managers today who have to fulfill that. And of course, they don't carry the same, I like to call the DNA of, of founders and, and, and the leadership that's there. So that's one different context. Uh, having said that, visibility pre-COVID was uh, being seen. That meant that I will stay in office till my boss is there. Otherwise, he will feel I'm not working hard enough. And a lot of similar behaviors was creeping in. And they were very unproductive. Uh, and no matter which part of the globe that we operate in, uh, there's always an organizational team politics that you know sort of plays around. Uh, some people who are very mindful of their time and they balance their work as well as personal lives, they would leave early, or you know they would balance it out. It was not perceived uh, as being visible or acceptable. And despite they making better and great contribution, uh, people who were more visible. Uh, they got more recognition and uh, visibility. And of course, in pandemic time, we struggled, we figured it out. And uh, thanks to all the uh, efforts were, that were made uh, to sensitize people all across the world to be kind and take care of people. You know, for example, we were told we have to pay salaries even if our businesses are shut nobody's coming there was no work uh, so we thanks to the pandemic have become a little bit more empathetic than we generally were and of course countries governments all of that uh, different parts of the world have done different things to make that uh, empathy uh, uh, visible acceptable so on and so forth and yes uh, many many startup founders who recognize this, they are building that culture, they're doing extremely well. Of course, there are many people who are very task oriented, still in a rush to kind of get their funding or to deliver the business success, be profitable. And they are stressed about getting you know, out of uh, uh, trouble, make profits, blah, blah, blah. And they've lost that uh, uh, empathy in the last one year if they have not been able to sail through the pandemic troubles. Uh, so that's very, very contextual uh, challenges that we are dealing with. And yes, we all need to be more mindful of, of our practices and, and figure out ways to make invisible visible. And how can we work alone and yet together? And of course, uh, platforms, tools like Butter, and all of us are in that direction and endeavor to make that magic happen. So thanks a lot for doing what you guys do at Butter. That's going to be a soundboard one. Come on, <laughs> let's give them a soundboard. <laughs> Love it. Thanks a lot for that. Andrea, over to you. Yeah, I just want to share um, actually one tool about uh, what we use in the terms of um, trying to accomplish that, um, make ourselves visible during the onboard. And I've done it in a couple of companies, um, the same one, and I'm sharing on the on the chat as well, the link that we use the uh, personal maps. And, and the personal maps we have done like in different ways, um, both um, asynchronous and synchronous and 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 then it, it obviously depends a little bit over the structure of the company and and then of the people that, that you know that that participate in the whole system but um, it works in great both ways because it's definitely a way for everyone to be able to put themselves out there and show who they are on a personal level right like what is your life what you do what you like what places that you've been experiences that you had um besides your professional um, um aspects of of your daily right life and and then it's a great way to create rapport um between the team members and, and everyone if, regarding if you are ceo or if you are just you know um, the, the assistant of someone, but like suddenly you realize that we are, you know, 
kind of a little bit the same sometimes and and then we share so many things and and the the, the create a record among um the the team members in the organization has been like one of the things that i've seen most successful in a way to keep everyone um around right so like one once we understand that we really like each other we really like to learn from each other we really have like a lot of things in common then you know like suddenly you you love the place that you work you love the place that you know like what you are spending most of your time anyway um so so that's a great start um i think on a really positive note that to start getting things personal with with the personal maps is a great tool and i totally recommend as like as a tool for everyone absolutely love that yeah really really cool i'm definitely gonna look into that i've never heard of them before um as yeah, a concept yeah, definitely the, looking into that. The practice from uh, from management people and all it has been amazing to me, and uh, I can only recommend that. That is just one of so many others that they have. But for the onboarding specifically, that's definitely one that we use the most. And, um, and yeah, I I only have great things to tell about it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Anna Maria, do we have time for uh, a few more? Um, I think uh, Larissa, you had um, had a question around uh, sort of my my business idea of, of where that's where that's come from. Can you just elaborate a little bit more uh, around that? Uh, no, I was checking your your website and I found I found it quite interesting uh, in terms of how. At, at least from my perspective, you you leverage your your career and your connections while bringing value uh, to the agencies in a specific niche. So I, I found it quite inspiring and would like to hear a bit more about. It. Yeah, brilliant. Um, if possible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'll, I'll give you a give you a nutshell. Um, the so I've been in the agency world from from the start. You know, I've I've also built my own agency. Um, I, I ended up running it into the ground um, just to give you a little bit of context there, which was uh, which was because I was a fat cat. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a fat cat is, is someone that basically strips out all of the profits and uses it for their own lifestyle, uh, which I, I didn't grow up with much money. So I kind of um, suddenly had it and then was like, oh, we can spend this on really stupid things. Uh, anyways, I learned a big lesson from that. I then built a community um, a peer support community to basically help others not do the same mistakes and so on. And that was about 500 members. It was all agencies. Um, so a peer support community just for agencies, agency founders. Uh, but I had a problem there as well. I didn't have the equity conversation at the beginning because the people who actually founded that organization um, brought me in all the way at the beginning to say, hey, do you want to do this for us? Um, and then when I tried to buy them out, I failed miserably. So anyways, after that, I, I decided to, to, to finally do it the right way. And that's when I built this. And I've taken all of the learnings over the last like 10 years, really, of doing this um, and, and, and have, I've put it all in one. And one of the biggest, the biggest struggles I've always had in the, um, in the agency world was how uh, agencies learn. Um, and what I mean by that, especially agencies of the size that I work with, right? So bear in mind, like 20 employees are sort of like the starting point, maximum 50 employees. It's when the founders first kind of step into that leadership role where they have to lead a, uh, lead a senior leadership team for the first time, possibly even. Um, and it's a really scary place for founders, especially, right? Or, or an MD that might be coming in at that time who hasn't done that before or even been promoted from within, right? And so, so what happens usually is that agencies end up going to a non-exec. That's the classic thing. That's the classic route. They go to an advisor. An advisor comes in who's basically done it before, you know, uh, worn the T-shirt and, uh, and basically brings in their way of what they've done 10 years ago or 20 years ago and basically tell you that's the way you have to do it because that's going to, that's going to make you successful, right? Now, they come with valuable stuff like i'm not saying that like non-execs aren't valuable and i definitely recommend people always like use a non-exec because they do bring a lot of valuable stuff but they come with loads of blind spots right like loads and loads and loads of blind spots like uh and and so for me the thing was like i always take it as a as an analysis uh, or analogy is if you if you pick up that one single diet that's being prescribed to you by that one single nutritionist 
and it doesn't work for your body, you're screwed, right? Like, um, and you go on, you go, oh, this diet didn't work or whatever. And the nutritionist goes, oh yeah, but you know, it didn't work for your body. You didn't do the right things and all this stuff. And that's the same argument that an advisor will have on an when it didn't work out. But actually what you wanted to do is you want to ten, speak to 10 different nutritionists and you want to try to get a full picture of, okay, well, what are all these different nutritionists saying? What do I, what am I actually looking for? What are the questions I need to be asking? What kind of diets work for my body, right? What are the sort of the bits and pieces that work for me? Not the full like formula. And, um, and that's kind of what I wanted to create. I wanted to create that whole part to allow agencies to basically reduce their blind spots on particular topics. And, um, and yeah, and I do that by bringing in advisors, multiple advisors, but also bring in, um, we've got this community, very tight knit community of about 16 agencies and all of their managers, people ops directors, client services, sales and marketing, the founders, the MDs, if they have them, they all learn from each other basically as well. Because when you get to that stage, like 20 to 50, there's a lot you've already done right and you can already learn from each other basically. Um, and the other thing as well is we bring in advisors from not just their agency world because that was another problem I had, that there's always this like echo chamber of like talking to an agency advisor who, you know, but the, there's no creativity in that, right? That's like going to chat GDP and asking it like, hey, um, what's the best thing I should be doing for my agency, right? Like, how should I run my sales and marketing? We'll give you exactly what you need to hear, right? But it's not necessarily the creative solution. So like looking outside of the industry, looking in sports, looking in, you know, sometimes we bring in people from the military or we bring in chefs who cook the meal and you know, or run a restaurant and things like that. And just sort of like try to extract as much information as we can from all these places and then implement it into the businesses. So, so that was the idea behind it. And yeah, it seems to work. It was started two and a half years, three years ago. And yeah, people are loving it. So I can't, I can't complain. <laughs> Congrats, sounds very cool. I, I feel I'm doing a part of it as well, but more manually, you know, in learning programs where you have modules and you have guests and you host, you know, people that would be interesting for CEOs. Yeah, sounds very yeah. good. Yeah, and you know what? That's an area that I'm quite interested in because I think the bit that, the bit that I would say, if I'm really honest, that's like the missing part from what we do is the actual behavior change bit, right? Like we provide a lot of information, a lot of know-how, right? But the part that's like missing is the like real one-to-one, -one, you know, hand-holding, let's change your behavior, right? Um, and that's something that we're looking at uh, integrating at some point as well, because that's that's always the thing with training, right? Like it's like you can take all the information in, but if you don't change, don't actually change, then what's the point in the first place, right? So, yeah. So maybe I'll come talk to you, Larissa, at some point. <laughs> Brilliant. But that is... Uh... I think there's uh, more people who want to talk to you, Daniel. So let's just also, maybe we can drop, I'll, I'll drop the community there later. So for agency owners, that would be good. But all in, do we have any more questions or things you're super curious to hear about? Do we have time? I was not we have uh, <laughs> yeah, very limited time. So if there's none, I think we can thank Daniel for everything he shared. <laughs> Daniel, thank, you, thank you so much. Uh, I got the tail end of it, but... Just uh, saying like more than happy for anyone to reach out, you know, have a continuous chat about this particular topic, your agency, um, or even like if you're, you know, doing something in the learning development space and stuff, I'm always happy to like exchange notes very collaborative so uh so yeah feel free to reach out on linkedin um and uh i'll uh, i'll get a, a call booked in with you more than That's happy awesome. to do that thank you for extending more of your time and before we end i'd love if people it would be great for you guys to share what insight actually stuck with you um from the session because there were a lot of juicy nuggets about onboarding building culture intentionally so it would be really great if you can share what your personal thoughts were and I'm also dropping the link for the next uh, next session, which is also going to be super interesting. It's all around crafting a PR strategy with Lucy Werner. So, it's in the notes. It has to be a thank you emoji. <laughs> yes, I've not got that yet. A thank you emoji. <laughs> it's, um, but I'm going to put a 
uh, or, uh, this or one, it kind of is, this, right? This one is, this one uh -huh. does it. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully this helps. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thank you to everyone for, for sharing. I think we all deserve a round of applause for that. We were also one minute behind time. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for your time. And thank you to Daniel for sharing all the insights. Yeah. And see you all More soon. than happy. Yeah. Enjoy you. the next session, everyone. <laughs> Bye.